You guys are a good looking group. I appreciate our team. They've worked all weekend from Friday all day yesterday, about six hours. And then from the early hour morning uh, this morning, they've been working. And so I appreciate them so much. It's Easter, everybody. It's Easter. It's Easter. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you're new, thank you for coming today. And I just want to be one of the many people to say those two words that we all love to say around here. Come on, one more time. Welcome home. We realize you could have went anywhere on Easter, but you chose to be with us, and uh, we don't want to take that for granted. Thank you for being here. I think we've got a great day planned. and a, I'm just going to take a few minutes to share with you something from the Easter story. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 20, if you have your Bible, you can open it up. If you don't have your written Bible, you can turn your Bible app on. Go to John 20. If you're watching online, give it up for everybody watching online today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. You, if you're watching online, you can open your Bible, turn your Bible on, whichever works for you. John chapter 20. I'm going to read to you John's account of the resurrection story. And then I want to read one piece, one detail of the story that's always intrigued me. It's, it's one piece of the story that's always puzzled me a little bit. It's made me scratch my head. And this week, I, I think I may have gotten just a little revelation on this piece. And so I just want to share a little rev with you today. John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. The Bible says that it was early on Sunday morning and it was still dark outside. Remember that detail. It's still dark. It's the wee hours of the morning. Sun hasn't come up yet. And Mary, she goes to the tomb and she finds that the stone has been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple. Now pause for a moment. Let me share this thought with you. When, when John is writing his book of the gospel, when, when, when John is writing this story, every time he refers to the other disciple, he's actually referring to himself. So remember that detail. He says that Mary came and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, which was himself. And now notice what he says. This is Bible humor, people. He says, the one whom Jesus loved. So in other words, he's like, you know, Peter gets on his nerves. I'm the one that he loves. Now notice what he goes on to say. It gets better. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Peter and that other disciple started out to the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I mean, this is some comedy right here in Scripture. Peter, he's saying, Peter gets on his nerves, and everybody knows that. I'm the one that he really loves, and I'm faster than Peter too. I can run better. I'm much more athletic. And then he says, that, that one that reached first stooped down and he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. But he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived. Then Simon Peter arrived. It's like he's implying, much later, Simon Peter shows up because, did I mention I'm faster? That's what he's saying. And then he goes inside and he notices the linen lying there while the cloth that covered Jesus' head was folded up, lying apart from all the other wrappings. Now notice, he says it again. This is so funny. Then the disciple who reached the tomb first. Now, now you've got to remember, all Scripture is breathed by the Holy Spirit, right? It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, these people wrote what they wrote, and the Holy Spirit got the final edit on it. So in other words, the Holy Spirit looks at what John writes and the Holy Spirit says, you know what? He does love you more than he did Peter. And you know what? You are faster than Peter. So go ahead and put that in there. So he just lets him leave it in there. So he goes in and he sees and he believes. For until then, it was still not understood to them what the Scripture said that Jesus must rise from the dead. So they go home. Mary is standing outside the tomb crying and she was weeping, she stooped down to look in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head, the other at the foot, where the body of Jesus had been laying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they've put Him. Now this is the piece of the story I want you to pay attention to. And this is the piece that's always, always intrigued me. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. Now, now remember, it's still dark outside. 
So to see someone means that she saw the silhouette of someone. She turns and she sees someone standing there in the garden where the tomb was. And it was Jesus, but she did not recognize Him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought that He was the gardener. Sir, she said, if, you, if you've taken away, if you've taken Him away, if, you've took a, if you took away my Lord, just tell me where you took Him and I'll go to Him. Mary, Jesus said. And in Hebrew, as her heart leaped inside of her, she said, teacher. Man, I love the resurrection story. Don't you love the resurrection story? The best news the world has ever heard came out of a graveyard 2,000 years ago. Jesus is alive. Our King has risen. He has conquered the grave. Jesus Christ is alive. I love that story. And, and I love John's account of the story, but there's one detail that's always fascinated me. This one detail at the end of what we just read has always left me scratching my head. And, and here's the detail. Apparently, Jesus spent some time just hanging out in the garden where the tomb was after He walked out of the grave. And, and that's the thing that's really strange to me. Like, after He comes back from the dead, He's just chilling out in the garden. Like, He just did what nobody could do. When Jesus walked out of that tomb, the word impossible was immediately deleted from the dictionary. He just fulfilled every prophecy. 333 prophecies in the Old Testament. He finished all of them. Like he has the heavyweight champion belt for anything that anyone would ever want to have victory over. And here he is just chilling out. Just, just pacing the garden. Mary assumes he's a gardener. It's that piece of the story that's puzzled me. Let me ask you a question. If you were Jesus and you had just come back from the dead, where would you go first? To whom would you go first? Now, I'm going to let you in on how twisted my mind can be at times. This is going to be scary. You guys are going to get to see the dark side of me. I can tell you're nervous. You guys, you're nervous, aren't you? I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've given some consideration to this. And I'm going to tell you where I would go and to whom I would go to first. And, and you may unfriend me after I share this with you. My first go-to. As soon as I walked out of that tomb, my first go-to would be Pilate. And I'm going to tell you what I would do. Let me check this out. Here's what I would do. I know exactly how I would do it. I would go to Pilate's house, and I would sit on his front porch. I would get there about 15 minutes before he got home after, after a long day, and I would have me a stick and a whittling knife. And I would just be whittling, waiting. Come on. Can you picture this right here? Here Pilate is, it's a long day. He pulls in his driveway on his donkey. And as he's coming up the driveway, I'm whittling. And every now and then I just glance up to look his way. And Pilate, the closer he gets to the house, he's thinking, who's on my porch? He gets a little closer and he thinks to himself, there ain't no way. There, there ain't no way. I would wait till he dismounted. I'm just whittling. Man, I've been waiting. This is a cinematic moment, people, right? Like you win Oscars for this kind of stuff. He dismounts that donkey. Here's what I'm doing. I'm stepping up real slow. And he's thinking to himself, it's him. It's him. Oh, snap. It is him. Now, I'm going to choose my first few words carefully, and I'm going to drop a one-liner. I'm talking like something on the Terminator, right? 
I'm talking like go back to an old Clint Eastwood film, right? I'm talking like a like 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 a die hard, you know, yippee. No, you can't go that way, but you know what I'm saying. I'm like, I'm gonna choose my words carefully. I'm gonna drop a one-liner of one-liners, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna square right up on him. And I'm gonna say something like, You should have listened to your wife. <laughs> Come on, ladies. Come on. Because if you know the story, then you know the story, right? I mean, he, he's about to let Jesus go or to have Him crucified, and his wife comes out and says, you don't mess with this guy. I have had dreams about this man today. I took a nap just a moment ago on the sofa, and I'm telling you, I had a dream of dreams, a nightmare. You let this man go. I am tormented right now because of this man. You better not crucify this man. I'd have squared up on him, and I'd say, you should have listened to your wife. I mean, where would you go? If you just conquered the grave. My second go-to, because I've thought about this. My second go-to, Herod. But I'd have done Herod different. I'd have went to Herod's house and hid under his bed. <laughs> now here's how this one would go down. I would go to Herod's house, I would hide under his bed, and I would wait until Herod got home. And then he's watched his favorite reality show. He's had his favorite meal, whatever. And then Herod comes to bed, and I would wait until he blew the candles out, and everything's super quiet, and everybody's real still. And then I would have spoke. I would have said something from up underneath that bed like, I'm back. <laughs> I would have had fun, right? Where would you go if you were Jesus? What would you have done? Who, to whom would you appear to first? Jesus didn't do what I would have done. Apparently, Jesus spends some time hanging out in the garden. And this week, I had a little revelation as to possibly, possibly why He did that. Uh, I want you to think with me for a moment. Of all the animals that God could have used, that Scripture could have used to, to illustrate who Jesus is and who Jesus was. Who Jesus continues to be. Of all the animals that, that the Bible could have used, the Bible uses two animals. And it's these two animals that give us a picture of who our Savior is, our Lord is. And the two animals are a lamb and a lion. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. We, we know that every year at Passover, God's people would bring a lamb to the priest, to the house of God. And they would sacrifice that lamb for the sin of that family. And all that goes way back in the Old Testament, Testament to the book of Exodus, when God's people were in bondage in Egypt, 450 years of slavery. God appears to Moses and God says, it's time for my people to come out of slavery, out of bondage, and you go tell Pharaoh to let them go. And so he goes and says, Pharaoh, it's time, you got to let my people go. And you know the story. He says, no. And so God sends ten plagues and they, they strike Egypt and all to break the will of Pharaoh. The last plague is there's a death angel that's going to pass through the country. The country. A death angel is going to pass through all of a nation of people. And the firstborn from every house is going to die. But God tells His people, you take a lamb for your family. Not just one lamb for everybody. Everybody took a lamb for their family. They slaughtered the lamb. They took the blood of the lamb, put it on their do doorpost. So when the death angel passed through that country, every home that had the blood of the lamb put on their doorpost, the death angel what? Passed over. That's where we get the phrase, the term, Passover. Jesus comes and John the Baptist points in his direction and says, Behold, the Lamb, not just another Lamb, behold, the Lamb of God who comes and He takes away the sin of the world. If you're grateful that the blood of the Lamb has been spilled for your sin, give God some praise in the house today. Yeah. 
So Jesus comes as a lamb. And Jesus suffers as a lamb. The Bible says as a lamb being led to the slaughter, our Lord went to the cross. Jesus died as a lamb. When they were pulling His beard out, He behaved like, like a meek lamb. When they whipped His back so that by those stripes we could all experience the healing power of God in our body. Come on, if you've ever had God touch you and heal you from something, make some noise right now. As they sat there and they, they beat Him and they mocked Him and they spit on Him and they would blindfold Him and say, prophesy who's going to hit you next. And they would punch Him and drove a, a crown of thorns down into His head. As they did all that, He behaved like a lamb as He stood before Pilate. Saying nothing. Saying nothing in His defense. And Pilate said to Him, why don't you speak up for yourself? Don't you realize I have the power to take your life or to give you life? All Jesus did was say, you would have no authority over me had it not been given to you by my Father. A lamb, a lamb. But my friend, when he walked out of that tomb, he didn't walk out a lamb. He walked out a lion. He walked out a lion on Sunday morning. John later on an island has a revelation and he writes the book of Revelation and in this revelation he sees Jesus. He starts the book of Revelation, Revelation 1. He has a vision of Jesus. He actually sees, he encounters Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Not the lamb, but the lion. And listen to what he says. It's not going to be on the screen. Let me read it to you. It's Revelation chapter 1. After he hears the risen Savior, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Bible says, he, he said, Then I turned to see the voice of the One who spoke to me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of those seven lampstands was one like the Son of Man. But He looked different this time. He was clothed with a white garment, a garment all the way down to His feet. He was girded about His chest with a golden band. His head and His hair were white like wool white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like brass refined in a fire in the furnace. His voice when He spoke was like the voice, the sound of many waters. He had in His right hand seven stars. It don't sound like a lamb to me, people. And out of His mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance to look into His face was like looking into the sun at full strength. Oh, he's talking about a lion, not a lamb. And when I saw him, in verse 17, he said, I fell like a dead man. <laughs> and listen to what, not the lamb, listen to what the lion says. I'm he who lives. I was dead. But behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell. Man! Thank God for a risen Savior. But my question is, what was he doing and why was he just chilling in the garden that Sunday morning? He was doing possibly what all lions do. Here's the revelation. The, the, the what if, the possibility of why he was just chilling there that day. You know when a lion defeats its prey, it doesn't just run off and leave the dead laying on the ground. When a lion defeats a prey, it will take some time to walk around it and to soak up the glory of that moment. A lion will leave that dead carcass laying there and with a chest stuck out, that lion will gloat. That lion with some swag about it will just prance around its prey saying to everything in the jungle, don't you mess with me because this is the way all my foes end up. 
I'm king of the jungle. Don't you be messing with me. This is what happens when you mess with me. Jesus didn't come out of the tomb as a lamb. He came out as a lion. And could it be that on that Sunday morning, He was doing what every lion does? If you give some thought to this and you do some research on this, you'll find out when a lion defeats a prey, there will be a moment of time where the lion will actually, after prancing and prowling around that and gloating in the glory of that moment, a lion will actually stand over the body of what it just defeated and with chest stuck out, it will not move anything but pivoting its head, it will scan the horizon. It's just looking for anybody who will dare to test it. And what that lion is doing is it is saying to every creature, I'm king. I'm king. I'm king. I'm king. I'm king. I'm king. The lion is the king of the jungle. That Easter morning, Jesus was doing what all lions do. He was enjoying the victory of what He had just accomplished. Not just for Himself, but for you and I. And He was doing what all lions do. He was standing there for a moment looking out over the span of time, looking into Easter 2023, into every single one of our lives, into every single one of our homes. And He was looking at things that you and I are facing, things I'm going through, things you're going through, things you need victory in, things I need victory in. And He was saying to everything in our life, I'm not just king of the jungle. I'm king of kings. I'm Lord of lords. I'm victorious over all I'm victorious over all. Oh, somebody put your heads together and give our King praise today. Hallelujah. The Bible says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? He's King. He's King. Look at what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. You were dead because of your sin. But then God made you alive with Christ. He didn't just come out for Himself. He came out of that tomb for us. To prove that there's nothing impossible that God can't do. He forgave all of your sins. Oh, let me take a moment just for a second and let me go on a rabbit trail. I say this from time to time and it needs to be said from time to time. You, you know, there's... there's a reality that, that once you close your eyes in this life, you're going to open your eyes in another life, in eternity. To be absent from the bodies, to be what? Present with? It is once appointed to all of us to die. Right after that, the judgment. Do, do you know that there is two places that somebody can spend forever? It's heaven or hell. Both those places are real places. And in a hundred years, the only thing that will be real in my life is one of those two places. Eternity. But do you know that nobody goes to hell because of sin? We just read that sin has been dealt with on the cross. He canceled the debt that our sin incurred. If I choose to go to hell, I don't go to hell because of my sin. I go to hell because I rejected the only one who paid for my sin. Well, If I were to go to hell, and I'm not going to hell, because Jesus is my Savior. Come on, somebody. I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I've received the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost in my heart. But if I were to go to hell, I would go to hell because I make a choice to pay for my own sins. And that's what happens. The reason why hell is a place that lasts forever is it takes forever to pay the debt off. But Jesus paid the debt. Cancel the debt. And now it's just about what am I going to do with Jesus? Am I going to receive the grace of God in my life? Am I going to turn and say, God, I'm broken. I need you. And I receive what you did for me on the cross. 
Or do I reject that? Well, the good news is, Paul says, we were all dead in sin, but Christ made us alive. He forgave our sin. He canceled the record of charges against us. He took them away. He nailed them to the cross. Woo! I'm feeling like preaching today. And then notice this. Notice this. This is the part I love in this passage because this is the part that speaks toward what lions do when they have victory in an area. When they've defeated a foe, he shamed publicly, making a spectacle of every demon in hell. And he triumphed over them all. Come on. Come on. I, I, I've got another random thought here and, and then we'll pray. We'll close. Uh, growing up, I would, uh, I had some friends that I would spend the night with. I've, I've got, I've got a buddy that I just saw right before church started. Chris Estep, man, from Harlan County, Kentucky, man. Where are these Harlan County guys showing up in Knoxville? So good to see my friend Chris. Gro- growing up, growing up, thank you guys. We'll put that right over here. Growing up, um, I, I would always either a buddy of mine would come over and spend the night or I'd go spend the night with uh, some buddies of mine. And, and without fail, every time I went to a friend's house, I had a few guys I would run with. And, and one thing that I always loved, and, and to be honest with you, I was always jealous of, is my friends all had a lot of trophies. Now these, I never had many trophies. Uh, matter of fact, I had to borrow these trophies. Uh, These trophies come by way of three different individuals. One, my man, my friend, Dawson Irvin. Come on, somebody. Uh, if If you knew the athlete this man is and this man will be, you'd be outside for an hour in line to get his autograph. I love my friend Dawson. Uh, the other two people who have their names on these trophies are my two kids, and that is Chaz and my daughter Tori. That's why some of them's cheerleading trophies. I'm just going to clear this up for my man Dawson. He's not a cheerleader, all right? Uh, never been in a beauty pageant either, all right? But, um, but he'd win if he was in one. So I was thinking this week about growing up, when I would go to my friend's house, all of them had some random piece of furniture in their bedroom. It may not have been white and girly like this one, but this is all I could get my hands on, so cut me some slack. But but all of my friends, no matter who it was, if I went to their house and I spent the night, they all had a piece of furniture in their bedroom covered in trophies. I I remember one of my buddies, uh, Chris Adams, he and his two brothers, Chad and Stephen, man, they they were like crazy good athletes. Incredible at football. Incredible, man. They could, they could, on any field, put one over the fence. They were just so athletic, man. These guys were, they were beasts. And I remember, it seemed like all my friends, they all had a piece of furniture like this. And I, I never had any. Matter of fact, when my kids were younger and they were playing t-ball and they were playing soccer, uh, we were looking at all their trophies one day. These are some of their trophies. And and my son spoke up and said, Dad, do you, where's all your trophies? Do you have any trophies? And I said, I have one. And I ran outside in the garage and I got the one. I knew where it was, man. This is my pride and joy, right? I got that one. I came back in and I said, here it is. And my son just came over and put his hand on my shoulder. He said, it's okay, Dad. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Bats broken off of it, like heads off of the batter and all that, you know. I always wanted to dress her like this and I was thinking this week about Jesus just hanging out in the garden. What was He doing? One, He was doing what all lines do. He was just saying to everything out there, I'm King. I'm King. In this life you're going to have trouble, but fear not, I've already overcome everything in this world. But could it be that Jesus, uh, if we can go there, I know, this is, uh, I know this is a little out there, but could it be that Jesus was just dusting off some trophies? Only Jesus' dresser, if he had a dresser in the garden, uh, his trophy would bear two names. It would bear his name, 
and it would bear our name. Like one of the trophies, one of the trophies would say, March 15th, 1992. Because of Christ, Jason Creech was set free. Because of Christ, addiction was broken off his life. Because of Christ, depression fleed and he had victory over oppression and depression. But because of, because of Christ, hopelessness, he had victory that day over hopelessness because of Jesus. Could, could it be that one of the trophies would say, baby, what day was it when Jesus touched your body and healed you? 19 win. One trophy would say, when Melissa, my wife, was given six weeks to live and the doctor said, you won't be alive in six weeks. One of the trophies would say, <laughs> March 17th, 1993, because of Christ, Melissa, then Rice, Rice, now Creech, was healed from ulcerated colitis and a death sentence of six weeks was dismissed in her life. I feel this in my bones today. I feel like the King of Kings is in this house to hand out some trophies. Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. If today you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're away from God, I'd love to pray for you right now. And it's as easy as opening up your heart and saying, God, I need you in my life. At a church called home, we call it making a new start. That's what happens when you say yes to Jesus. So come on, if that's you, why don't you just pray with me? Go ahead and bow your head and let's pray together. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm inviting you into my life. Forgive me of every wrong I've ever done. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Today, I'm making a new start. In Jesus' name, thank you for saving me. Amen. Hey, you know what? I believe when the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. I believe the Bible means that. So I want to ask you to do me a favor. If, if today you prayed that prayer, would you text the words, Welcome Home to 94,000? And you can check that you gave your heart to Christ. And I'd love to send you one of my latest books. It's called Making a New Start. And it will be a blessing to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Can't wait to see you next week. God bless and welcome home.